Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody. So happy to have you all here. I'd like you to turn to Daniel chapter 9. We're on our final message here on in chapter 9, Daniel's 70th week. It's, this is our third Sunday to walk through these verses. And I'm so glad to cap this off for everyone today and for us to get right down here to the very end of the end times. And it's been a blessing to share these messages with you these last couple of weeks about uh, future prophecy, straight from God Almighty into our eternal word of God here. So thankful for this passage. By the way, everybody, I wanted to uh, remind you to be in prayer for Bonnie Trousdale. Bonnie hasn't been with us uh, personally because... I guess maybe a couple years ago she went into an assisted living home and I would say she's by now in her mid to late 80s now and uh, it's really sad. We've been praying for her daughter, Sherry. She went into hospice care this past Wednesday, but unfortunately Sherry went home to be with the Lord. I say unfortunately for Bonnie, but praise God for Sherry and all the struggles and fights that she had with the disease that was uh, taking her away from her family, but um, Bonnie was just uh, so full of faith this past Wednesday before she even passed away. She was just uh, saddened deeply by um, her daughter taking, you know, she feels like she should have been the one going first and not her daughter, but uh, just keep Bonnie in your prayers, and I know she'll appreciate that, and um, and also, I wanted to thank everybody for the cards and the continued prayers for my family and my sister's passing just a little over a week ago. I appreciate that so much. Still getting cards in the mail. But we're going to look at Daniel chapter 9, beginning with verse 24. And before I read that, let me just say this also. Let's remember to pray for our president, for all the people around him, our first lady, for the senators, for all these people in the cabinet that uh, have uh, gotten COVID this past week. And you know what, let me just say this. We, and of course the entire, what God is trying to do, C.S. Lewis, decades ago, in the mid 20th century, in the 50s, C.S. Lewis said, pain is God's megaphone to arouse a deaf world. God is trying to call this world back to him. And you know what? He's tried other things in years gone by to wake people up, to get people to listen, especially people who aren't believers. And so, you know, again, I'm not saying that COVID just strikes non-believers, but what I am saying is that we need to uh, realize that this isn't just a fluke. This isn't just something that out of the blue happened, and I realize where it happened, I realize where it's come from, but what I'm trying to say to everybody is this, God is sovereign. That's been our theme through the whole book of Daniel, God is sovereign, and if God allows this to happen, he's got a good purpose and a reason for it. And so we need to be praying for people and praying that uh, the ones that, you know, I've just seen some, some awful, I saw like, Maybe a week ago, I saw on television that a 27-year-old female doctor, I mean, she was an OBGYN, I mean, you know, bringing babies into the world and helping women, and, 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 and COVID took her at the age of 27. You know, it just was, you know, I almost started to cry when, when I saw that on the news because it was heartbreaking. I thought of my daughter. My daughter, Lauren, works at... Methodist Hospital in Richardson, and day after day she's around so many that have COVID. And, uh, and so, you know what, and, and by the way, even President Trump, he was being interviewed, and I'm trying to think, who was he talking to when he said this? Oh, it was George Stephanopoulos on, on ABC. George Stephanopoulos was talking to President Trump about maybe a week and a half ago or so, and he, he said to George, you know, he said, uh, <laughs> I'm doing his, I'm imitating him. <laughs> but he, President Trump was saying, you know, uh, 
it's made me realize just how frail life really is. He said, I've seen six, six, you know, like, I guess personal friends, people that he knew really well. He said, strong people, powerful people. And he said, they're gone. And he said, if it's done anything to me, it's made me realize, you know what? Life is very frail. It can be here and then be gone. And so, anyway, let's keep our, you know, the Bible tells us in, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, pray for those who are in authority. Pray for kings and for all those who are in authority. And we need to do that. We need to pray for our president and our government. But not only that, we need to pray for all the people that, you know, many, many families have lost loved ones to COVID. So let's just pray that, uh, that God may bring this to pass, I mean, bring this to, to an end sooner than later. We could ask God for that. And we could pray for his will to be done, though, even so. So, okay, well, let's go ahead and look at verses 9, or Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27. What do we have here? Remember, this is the angel Gabriel coming to Daniel. Daniel's old. Daniel's in his final years. And he comes to Daniel and he says, Daniel, I know that you've been thinking about this. You've been in exile. You've been snatched from your home in Jerusalem and you've been 500 miles away for nearly 70 years now, Daniel. So if Daniel was 15 when he was taken, he's probably in his early 80s now. He's been in Babylon for almost 70 years. And the Gabriel says to Daniel, Daniel, 70 weeks. Notice I put in your notes, sevens. Everybody has one of these, I believe? Okay, I think everybody's got one. Okay, if you don't, raise your hand. Daniel will look for your hand. Seventy sevens. Seventy periods of seven. We told you that it's years. So 490 years are determined for your people, Daniel, Israel, and for your holy city, Jerusalem. I've got plans, God says, that are going to take 490 years. What do these plans involve? Well, we talked about this two weeks ago. There are six of them. Number one, to finish the transgression. Number two, to make an end of sins. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. By the way, that last one, to make reconciliation for iniquity, is the only one that's been fulfilled so far. The other five are waiting to be fulfilled. That one, to make reconciliation for iniquity, is the cross of Christ. Jesus made reconciliation for your sins and mine, and not for our sins only, 1 John 2 says, says but for the sins of the whole world. You know, there are preachers and there are theologians that believe that Jesus only died for the people that would one day be in heaven. But that is just not what Scripture says. When John saw Jesus coming, John the Baptist, he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the elect. Is that what he said? No, he said, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, by dying on the cross, made every single person who's ever been born or ever will be born, made that person savable. If Saddam Hussein wanted to be saved, he could have been saved. If Idi Amin wanted to be saved, he could have been saved. You name it, you just go down. Uh, Charles Manson, if he wanted to be saved, he could have been saved. Why? Because Jesus paid for every single sin humans ever have or ever would commit. Jesus, like the old hymn says, paid it. He made reconciliation for, sin, for iniquity. That's the only one that's been fulfilled. Now there's three others here that are waiting to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, or really to end vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy, and the word place should have been put in there, to anoint the most holy place. All of those, of course, are going to take place when Jesus returns to earth, okay, as well as the first two to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins. Okay, so we already looked at all those. Verse 25, my turn. 
Know therefore, know therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Okay, so there's going to be 69 weeks of years, or they could have just put in here, there's going to be 483 years. All right? The street shall be built again, and the wall, of course, of Israel, of Jerusalem. And even in troublesome times. Verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. So after those 483 years that began with the decree from Artaxerxes the king, 400 some years before Jesus, 483 years elapse, Palm Sunday, and right after that, and after the 483 years, Messiah shall be cut off. You would be crucified. That's why on your chart you have that little cross right after Palm Sunday, after the 62 weeks, after the 483 years. Messiah shall be crucified, but not for himself. And the people, now here's where we're going to start focusing here this, today. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Okay, so let me just say this. If you've missed, if you're, if you're tuning in with us online or if you're here today in person, if you've missed last week or the week before, both of those are on YouTube. You just go to YouTube and you plug in Rich Point Fellowship and boom, suddenly you will be seeing like a bunch of pictures of yours truly or one of the elders because Robert's got them all up there. Ding, 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 ding. And I didn't know this. I asked Robert, but he said, I said, Robert, how long have you been putting up sermons? And he said, well, I've been putting your videos up since 2015. So, like, if you do 50 a year, that's like uh, 250 videos, you know. I mean, so there's a whole bunch that you can go back and, and look if you want to just, like, you could pick out one. If you need some encouragement, you could pick out one that's a from the Psalms or something that'll be encouraging to you or whatever. But there's a whole bunch of them there for you. Many, many videos. But the last two Sundays are the ones that I was focusing on, on verses 24 through 26. Now, today's message, it's going to revolve around this verse, which is verse 27, okay? So let's read this carefully, because this one is, is another one that's going to need a little bit of, of translation tweaking, uh, and I'm going to go into that very carefully, okay, so you'll understand that. Okay, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, how long is one week? Seven years. There's going to be a covenant that's going to be, a, let's say, okay, let me use a modern word, treaty, a treaty, a peace pact. Okay, that's what they call it. President Trump brought peace between Dubai and, and Israel, okay, a, a peace treaty. Okay, that's a covenant. A covenant is when, okay, they call it the covenant of marriage, okay? You get married and you make a covenant, okay? Uh, Till death do we part, okay? You make a covenant. That's what this is, a treaty. It's an it's a agreement. They sh he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, for seven years. But in the middle of the seven years, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. Okay, so obviously this involves the Jews because there's sacrificial offerings going on. Animals are being uh, sacrificed in the temple. Okay, in the middle of the seven years, he's going to say, stop. Or someone, we haven't decided who this is yet, but someone is going to put an end to the Jewish offerings in the temple during the tribulation period. On the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Okay, who is this one who is making desolate? Who's desolating, making things, uh, destroying things? Well, of course, we're, gonna, we're going to say it's going to be the, the man of sin, who most would call the Antichrist. 
he's going to be making desolate, even, even until the consummation, till the end. Well, so how long is he going to be doing that, everybody? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. The man of sin does not show up at the rapture. He doesn't come on the scene. Now he's alive, and he is a Middle Eastern king, and he's an Assyrian. The book of Micah tells us in Micah chapter 5, when the Assyrian comes and treads in our land. So this, this desolator, he's going to be there during the first three and a half years, but it's not until he goes into the temple in the middle of the seven years, and he says, I am God, and these sacrifices will stop right now. No one's offering sacrifices. If you're going to be offering sacrifices, you're going to be offering them to me because I've done what no other human's been able to do through the power of my might and through my wisdom. I took those two preachers out that for three and a half years have been bringing plague after plague after trouble after trouble on the world, and I rid the earth of those two men, and the God that was worshipped in this very room, these sacrifices are over, and now I will be worshipped. I am God. Okay? So, on the wing of abominations, we'll talk about what that is in a moment, shall be one who makes desolate. We're going to desolate the temple, even until the end, which is determined, is poured out <laughs> on the desolate. That last word should really be, and we're going to come back to that, desolator. It says the consummation, the end, is poured out on that desolator. The end is poured out on that man who says, I am God. Hey, anybody that says that, guess what? The end's coming. <laughs> God doesn't pull any punches. God's like, no, nobody one-ups me. You want to call yourself God? You know, what did, dev, what did the devil tell Adam and Eve? That who, did they, who did he tell them that they could be like? You can be like God. Who was saying that? Was that God telling them that? Or was that, you know, he was, he was saying, has God said that? God, God didn't. Did God tell you that? That you shouldn't eat that fruit? <laughs> he, was, he was battling from the beginning against the true God. All right, so what do we got here? Well, we're continuing God's plans for the future of Israel. God's future plans for Israel, part two. This is going off of what we started last week, and really three weeks ago. We just had a different name for it. But from the beginning, Gabriel's come and said, Israel, or Daniel, God's got plans for your people and for the city. And by the way, everybody, why do we, why is this important to us 2,500 years later. This was written 2,500 years ago. Why does this make any difference to us? Because what we want to ask is, okay, did some of these things come true that the angel Gabriel said? Oh, yeah. A king got up. He made a command. Wow, that came to pass. And the command the kings made was at the wall and the uh, city was going to be rebuilt. The wall, let's see, what did it say again? The street and the wall. That happened. Wow, Daniel predicted it 100 years earlier. And then there was reconciliation made for sin 550 years later when Jesus came to earth. Wow. Wow, these are unbelievable, unbelievable things. Well, let's bow our heads and pray, and then we'll jump right into the rest of this message. Father, of course... Father, if any human preacher thinks that he's going to be able to impact lives and bring people to Jesus uh, without the hand of God, without the help of God, he's just kidding himself. And so I stand before you, Father, and ask that your mighty hand would rest upon me and that the Spirit of God would speak to all of our hearts. Let us go out of here encouraged. Let us go out of here lifted up by your word. And let us go out of here, Lord, remembering that we're commissioned by you to touch the lives of others and bring others to you, Jesus. And we pray it in your precious name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. Amen. All right. Now, look at our chart there. Let's look at our little chart there for a minute. I've got, I think I've got it to put up here on the, yes. 
Okay, so we've already looked at this fairly well, but I just want you to notice that after those 483 years that Daniel talked about in the verses we read earlier, it said after the 483 years, Jesus would be cut off. He would be crucified. See, that's why I have the cross not on Palm Sunday. The 483 years ended on Palm Sunday. After that, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Now, there's a huge time gap. Okay, so that's, let's go ahead and go to number eight there on your notes. We'll come back to this chart. But number eight, I don't know if I put that up here or not. Okay, there's the time gap. Okay, let's go back. Let me, can I go back? Yeah. Okay, so there's the big time gap right there. Since Jesus was crucified, all the way to what we're waiting here for is the rapture of the church. Now, you say, Pastor Bob, when's the rapture going to take place? Jesus said, no one knows the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. No, not even the Son of Man. Now you say, well, now wait a minute, Pastor Bob, Jesus was God. How could he not know? Well, when he was on earth, what he was admitting to his disciples around him was, no man knows when that's going to take place right there. No man knows. But he said, I don't even know it. What he was admitting was that Jesus was 100% God when he walked the earth. But he was 100% human as well. Okay? This is, this is uh, beyond our comprehension, okay, how this can take place. But apparently what happened is the God side of Jesus limited the human side of Jesus. And basically, God, God's persona in Jesus basically said to the human Jesus, I'm going to block that in the human brain of Jesus. Jesus as a human, and as he's talking to those men around him, says, right now, I've blocked this off. Or maybe even the Father did it. We, we don't know, but maybe the Father blocked it. But Jesus said, right now, I, I don't know the day or the hour that the Father has determined that I will return. Now, of course... He's seated at the right hand of the Father right now. I'm sure he knows now. But he may not. You never know. God may be holding it from him. <laughs> just say, just, just, I'll tell you. But it's, anyway, it's not that important of a question. But what is important here today is I wanted you to notice I put a green arrow pointing at this one week. And what this is called in the Bible, the seven-year tribulation period, it's called Daniel's 70th week. Because Daniel talked about 69 weeks and one week. Well, that 70th week is the one week. It's the seven-year tribulation period. Later in Daniel, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is Israel. Jacob is another name for Israel. You remember? Uh, Jacob got his name changed. Back, I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, God changed Jacob's name. Jacob means trickster. <laughs> Jacob means uh, cheater or trickster or liar, and he changed it to Israel, prince. Okay, so anyway, so that's all the same, same week. Daniel's 70th week is the seven-year tribulation period, is the time of Jacob's trouble. And there's probably other names for it in Scripture. But those are some of the ones that you'll see. Okay, so number eight, I told you that there is a time gap. You want to write that in. There's a time gap between the 69... 69 weeks, 483 years, and the seven years. 483 plus 7 equals 490. We're talking about 490 years of Israel's history. 483 of those years have already happened, and now there's just one period of seven years that once that happens, Jesus is returning to this earth. And that'll happen right there, Christ's kingdom here, he comes down to the sky, right? We will meet the Lord where? In the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So at the rapture, that none of us know, Jesus says, I'm coming like a thief in the night. Thief doesn't come and knock on your door. I'm going to rob you. No, Jesus says, I'm coming like a thief, unexpected. And boom, 
All of a sudden, we are in the air with the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So what, what happens is, at the rapture, let's say Jesus is here with his Father in heaven. He comes down to the air at the rapture, but seven years later, he continues at his second coming. Phase one, phase one of his second coming to the air, phase two to the earth. He comes down, and then we con he continues on down at the end of the seven years. It's all the second coming, but in two phases, okay? So, now, um, people might ask this question. Um, how do we know that we're still waiting for the seven years? How do we know that? Does anybody want to make a guess on that? Well, the way that we would know that is those six things that we looked at earlier. Okay, I'll do it this way. Six things in Daniel 9.24. Only one of them has been fulfilled. Now, watch this. If Jesus had fulfilled all six, let's just say that at the crucifixion, he got the one taken care of, he rose from the dead, and then, because of Israel's rejection of him, he brings the tribulation period in in, let's say, 34 A.D. Let's say in 34 A.D. he had brought the, the last seven years in way back here, okay? Then what, is, what does that mean if he started it in, say, 34 and the seven years finished in 41 A.D.? What would have happened in 41 A.D.? Well, he would have brought in everlasting righteousness. The most holy place would have been anointed again. He would have ended Israel. All those six things would have been done. And his kingdom would have started back in 41 A.D. But you and I know this. That didn't happen. Everlasting righteousness hasn't been brought in. The most holy place has not been anointed. It's not even been built. It's, there's, a, there's a mosque, a Muslim mosque, sitting on top of that plat of land in Jerusalem. That is waiting to be built. They're ready to build it. They're ready to build it. But things have to happen before Israel can do that. But nonetheless, it will happen. That 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 temple of God will be rebuilt and there will be sacrifices offered in it. We'll get into that a little bit later today. Okay, so the reason we know <laughs> that we're still waiting for Daniel 9 to be fulfilled is that we're still waiting in the future. There's been this big gap of time. And you say, man, that's really strange, Bob. That's kind of weird. That really can't be what the Bible teaches. Okay, I'll show you. I'll show you. I'm going to put up here Zechariah 9. It's in your notes. Zechariah 9 and 10. Okay. So, Zechariah 9 and 10. This is a prophecy that was given about 520 B.C. Zechariah, after the Jews came back from exile, he and Haggai were the two. Now, not John Haggai. I know John Haggai has been a preacher a long time, but he wasn't a preacher in 520 B.C. He would be really old, okay? But this is the prophet Haggai and Zechariah. They were both preaching simultaneously uh, because the, the, the uh, temple needed to be rebuilt. They got it started about 538 B.C., and then they got lazy, and it sat there for 20 years while everybody built their houses and fixed their houses up in Jerusalem. They came back from exile, so they spent 20 years getting their houses in order, but left the, uh, God's house in shambles. And so Zechariah and Haggai started preaching around 520 B.C., and... And this is one of the prophecies that Zechariah gave. And, of course, you know what it is. It's about Jesus coming to Jerusalem on a donkey, right? So he, this is 520 B.C. This is way back over here. And so he says, hey, Israel, in the future, your king's going to come to you, and he's going to be just, and he's going to have deliverance, and he's going to be uh, humble and riding on a donkey. Did that happen, everybody? Yes, it was fulfilled on Palm Sunday. But Zechariah doesn't end in verse 9. He keeps prophesying. He keeps prophesying. I will cut off. This is talking about God. Oh, God says, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. 
and I'll cut off the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow. Notice I underlined all those three. Why? Because that's the only thing that armies had back then. If those get cut off, if those get taken away from an army, they're not an army anymore. <laughs> all they had were chariots, horses, and bows and arrows. That was it. Okay, so basically it's their entire thing. Of course, they had spears and different... But I'm just saying, for the most part, you take that away from an army, and they're not going to be doing much fighting. Okay? And he's prophesying. This is going to happen. God is going to take that away. He, Messiah, shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea. Jesus is going to have a worldwide dominion. And from the river to the ends of the earth. This is going to cover not just Israel, it's going to cover the whole earth. And you say, so Pastor Bob, what does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Okay, here's what I'm saying. Here's another prophecy like Daniel's prophecy where you've got a near fulfillment, 555 years after it was given, a, a relatively near fulfillment. And then... You've got a far-off fulfillment. They're right there. See that line I put in there for you? That You could put gap right on that line. Gap. Why? Because this hasn't even come close to being fulfilled. He said that was going to happen in 520 B.C., and we're still sitting here at 2020 A.D. waiting for it to happen. Gap. Gap, 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 gap. Fulfilled on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago to be fulfilled at Christ's return. Okay, so you get the picture. In the Bible, okay, I'll give you another one. I've, I've already mentioned this one recently. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Has that happened? Has God given us the Messiah? Has, has he sent Jesus? A son has been born, a child has been born, the son's been given? Yeah, so Isaiah's prophecy there, is been fulfilled. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Has that happened yet? No. God has not placed human government on Jesus' shoulders until he returns. So you have one verse, Isaiah 9, 6, right there, with a line right through it. Gap. So there are plenty of these in the Old Testament. And when you read your Bible, don't get thrown off because you'll be reading about stuff that's already happened. Then in one verse, from verse 9 to verse 10, he's still prophesying, but you're like, well, wait a minute. When he rode in on the donkey, this didn't happen. I know it didn't happen because just like in all these places, they're a near prophecy and a far prophecy. Okay? So that's just one of many. Now, the passage we've been studying is another one. You've got near and you've got far. Daniel 9, verses 25 and 26. 25 and 26 take place hundreds of years later. Verse 27 that we're going to right now takes place in the future. We don't know when. Okay, so let's look at this. Now, it might be hard for you to see, so on your notes, I believe it might be easier... Oh, I actually didn't, I guess I did put it on your notes, but I didn't underline the word he. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, for seven years. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. Okay. The key question here, everybody, is this. Whoops. Oh, I guess I didn't put it on there. Okay. The key question here, I have it here to turn it, but it didn't get on there. The key question is, who, it's in your notes, who is the he? Who's the he? Okay, that's got to refer back to somebody. All right, so generally uh, it's understood, okay, generally it's understood that the he, we've got verse 26 and verse 27, the he is the prince, then he the prince who is to come, who destroys the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary. Last week we told you that was Titus. That was Titus. 
okay, the son of the Roman emperor Vespasian, Vespasian. So is that who this prince is? He shall confirm a covenant with many. Is that who it's referring to? That's a possibility, okay? That's a possibility. In he, what I mean by that is from the Hebrew language the Bible was written in. Scholars, Hebrew scholars say definitely that pronoun can be translated he, okay? Now, uh, on the other hand, there's another way that a Hebrew scholar says that this can be translated, okay? Another way <laughs> is that the he, which is actually plural, if I'm understanding correctly, in Hebrew, it can be translated they. Then they shall confirm a covenant. The people, not the singular, the prince, but the people. So if he is really they, then they shall confirm a covenant. It's not talking about the prince, it's talking about the people of the prince. Now somebody amaze me and tell me who these people were that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, I mean the sanctuary and the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Who were these people? Very good. More than one person. I'm amazed. All right. Um, and so the people are the Romans. Now, let me ask you this. When we looked at that giant statue earlier in the book of Daniel, remember I hand, had those handouts, and we had the head of gold and the chest and arms of silver and the belly and thighs of brass, and it had toes. It had toes made of clay and made of, uh, of metal, right? Iron and clay. Those ten toes represented what I called the revived Roman Empire in the end times. There's going to be ten nations that are connected with the empire, the ancient empire of Rome, and they are the people. It's not the Romans, you know, like the people, it's, it's not the people living right in, in Rome, Italy. That's not what I, when I say it's the Romans, that's not what we're referring to. We're referring to the, these ten nations. They shall confirm a covenant with many. You say, then who would the many be, Pastor Bob? It's obvious. Who is this prophecy? Who did um, Gabriel the angel tell Daniel this whole prophecy was about? Israel, your people your nation, your city, Jerusalem. So they, the revived Roman Empire, shall confirm a covenant with Israel for seven years. Okay? The revived Roman Empire. Now, listen. I realize, by the way, everybody, follow me. I, I don't want to, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this because with prophecy, you've got to be careful with prophecy. Other people say this is the Antichrist. Other people say this, because they put it with the prince. He, the prince, that was Titus, but he's picturing the Antichrist to come. Just like Titus desolated Jerusalem, one day the Antichrist is going to come and desolate the temple, and see, we've got, and see, they'll, they'll take it as the Antichrist, or they'll take it as the false prophet. I know someone who takes it as the false prophet. I also know people that take it as the Romans, that they say, this should be they. They shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay? All right? They. Okay? Plural. They shall confirm a covenant. And in the middle of the week, they shall bring an end to the sacrifice. Because the ten nations are in cahoots with the man of sin. Okay? So it's the man of sin and those ten nations who are going to step in they're going to bring their armies and say, the sacrifices are ending, and they're taking it over. I'm God. I'm the world's dictator now. I'm ruling over this earth, and everyone will listen to me. You'll take my mark in your hand or your forehead, so on and so forth. They're going to totalitarianism, but not just in this nation or that nation or this country or that country, totalitarianism over the whole earth. 
Everyone will either be an insider and take the mark of the beast, or you'll be an outsider and they'll want to decapitate you. They'll want to behead you. You could read about that in Revelation chapter 20, that in the end times, the Christians that will be alive back then are going to be in danger of a, gru a gruesome death. Okay? So, uh, these ten nations are going to initiate this covenant. Now you say, Pastor Bob. Now here's something very interesting, everybody. President Trump just did something with Dubai and Bahrain that no one's ever done before in the history of mankind. He's brokered peace between Israel and those two countries. President Trump said that he may have seven more. You know what? That's nine. And if the revived Roman Empire, the Romans here represent ten nations, this is kind of getting very interesting. Are you saying, Pastor Bob, you're for sure that's... No, I'm not sure at all. I'm just saying that's very interesting that those kind of numbers are being thrown out there. We could be getting closer to the return of Christ than we can ever imagine. But, folks, here's what you got to do. you got to wake up every day, and you got to live like Jesus isn't coming for 500 years. You know what happened to the Thessalonians in the Bible? They got bad info from preachers that Jesus was coming back right like in the next weeks or months or, you know, in the real soon. He was coming back at very, very soon, like... And so you know what they did? They all went and quit their, well, not all of them, but they went, some of them went and quit their jobs. <laughs> and Paul comes in and he says, no, 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 no. Jesus is coming quickly, okay? He's coming soon, quickly, meaning when he comes, it's going to be like that, the twinkling of an eye. But, hey, listen, we don't know when, so you live like it might be 500 years from now. You go, you wake up and say, Lord, I sure hope you come today, and I'm going to live like you're coming today, but you know what? I'm not going to go and crawl into a cave and become a hermit. I'm going to keep trying to witness to others. I'm going to keep giving to God's kingdom. I'm going to keep blessing other people. I'm going to be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving others. Just as Christ has forgiven me, I'm going to keep doing those things. We don't change. I know it, we're in the middle of COVID. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm continuing to witness. I'm continuing to pray for people and for neighbors and friends and relatives for their salvation. Why? Because we can't give up. We got to keep going until the day Jesus comes back. Jesus says, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? Am I going to find people walking by faith or are they going to all be lazy inside of a cave? No, we got to be following our king and his directives. Okay, let's go on down to verse 9. We figure out the they is, the they represents the, the revived Roman Empire. Okay, the they. And, oh, I put it up here. <laughs> I had more, more slides than I thought. The many are the Jews. The Jews will need help of these ten nations to rebuild the temple and to protect Israel. So apparently everybody, and listen carefully, apparently something happens with all these nations that are supposedly taking care of Israel right now. Israel is a tiny little country, right at smack dab in the middle of the entire earth. It's God's people. It's God's place. It's where Jesus is going to live forever and ever and ever in the new earth. But follow me. Something's going to happen where the Jews are going to need a peace treaty with ten nations. They're going to need a peace treaty. Something's going to happen, apparently, to America. Because we're one of the, like, we are the greatest protector of Israel. So, does America go down um, financially? Down to horrible straits? Does America go down militarily because of that? Who knows? But for some reason in the future, Israel is going to be saying, peace, safety, peace, safety, we're in danger. And they're going to make a treaty. They're going to have to give some things up to make this treaty. All right? And so, 
it's going to be very, very interesting to see how this all plays out. We may be seeing some things right now. Okay, now, number nine. The activities of the man of sin, the end-time dictator, the end-time ruler of the whole world, the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. Go down the list. There's a lot of names. Most people call him the Antichrist. I think that's the false prophet. Antichrist, false prophet. He's against Messiah. It's a religious thing. This guy is a political guy. This guy is the president, the emperor over the whole earth. The activities of the man of sin in the 70th week. Okay, what is the prophecy made to Daniel from Gabriel? On the wing of, I put it in your notes, with. That's probably a better translation there. With abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Okay? Abominations are activities or things God hates. Like, ooh, that's an abomination to God. He greatly detests it. He hates it. Pride, lying, so on and so forth. There's things that God hates. God says, you know what? I hate what the man of sin is doing in Jerusalem in the middle of the tribulation period. You might want to jot down Matthew 24, 15, right there by abominations. Matthew 24, 15. Jesus said, when, when, the, when, the, uh, when you see the abomination of desolation, there's those two words. Where's Matthew getting those from? Right from Daniel. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, get out of Jerusalem. When is that? In the middle of of that last seven years, right in the middle. When you see the man of sin go into the temple and desecrate it and desolate it, get out of there. Don't even, if you're in your field, don't even go back to your house to get anything because his army's coming after you. His army is going to be coming after you. So the one who makes desolate is the man of sin. The abominations are the activities or the things God hates. Oh, I have it in your notes. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I put it in there. Matthew 24, 15. There it is. So we just quoted that. Okay, sorry about that. And so, then Gabriel says to Daniel, when will this go till? Okay, it's going to go. On the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation, even until everything is wrapped up, watch this, when Jesus comes down from the sky and the Bible says in Zechariah 14, 4, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. It says he shall step onto the Mount of Olives. And by the way, a 200-mile valley is going to be split when his feet, talk about power. Talk about power. You think people on earth have power? Not like Jesus, because the Bible says when his feet touch the ground, for 200 miles this valley is going to be cut right out of the earth by his power. Hey, a God that can speak a universe into existence that's 14 billion light years across, a God who can say, let there be light. <laughs> and the universe is, that, that's power. All right, hallelujah. All right, so let's finish this up, everybody. Who is the desolate? Well, even until the consummation, we're continuing this verse, even until the consummation, the end, which is determined, God's determined when it's going to happen, it's poured out on the desolate, better translation, on the desolator. The end, the consummation is going to be Pour it out. The man of sin is going to be flooded with God's judgment. It's going to be poured out on him. Poured out on the desolator. And I have the verse in your notes, 1145 of Daniel. We'll get to this a little bit later in Daniel. That, that end time ruler is going to plant the tents. By the way, you notice there are the tents. He's been a lifelong Bedouin. He's not an American. He's an Assyrian. He's a Bedouin. He doesn't live in... His palace isn't a 
stone building made of stone or brick, that ruler is going to plant his tents, the tents of his palace. And by the way, don't get me wrong. We're not talking about a pup tent that you take on a trip to the forest. If you ever go to the Middle East and you look at some of these tents, they cost millions of dollars. These tents are elaborate. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Okay? The Mediterranean Sea and the glorious holy mountain, that's in Jerusalem. So he's going to be out there during the end, end of uh, the, the, during the tribulation period. That's going to be where he's ruling from. First, he's only ruling over his area in the Middle East. But in the middle of the seven years, he's ruling over the whole world. He's going to get an upgrade from Satan, a really nice promotion from Satan, going from a Middle Eastern despot to the king over the whole earth. Yet, I love the Bible. <laughs> This guy's ruling over the whole, I have all power. He's like all of these Marvels movies, right? They're on fire and they're yelling and they got the fire coming out of them. I got power. And then Wonder Woman goes and wipes the guy out. Remember that guy? I forgot what his name was. But anyway, um, so anyway, yet, I love the Bible, yet, he shall come to his end. The last day of the seven years. By the way, this man and his false prophet, listen to me, are going to be the very first human beings who are ever thrown into the eternal lake of fire bodily. They don't die. <laughs> the angels come. Jesus is on earth. And Jesus says, uh, hey, get these two thugs. Get these two thugs. Get him out of here. I don't ever want to see him again. Of course, he will see him because he's going to see him at the great white throne judgment. They're not, they're not angels. They're humans. But they're humans that are possessed of Satan, very powerful humans for three and a half years. Yet, by the way, the book of Job says, Job chapter 20, I believe, the triumphant, listen carefully, the triumphing of the wicked is short. The triumphing of the wicked is short. He gets three and a half years. Remember Satan offered Jesus? I'll give you all the, all the kingdoms of the earth, and I'll give you all their glory if you'll bow down and worship me. He says, nah, no thanks. He says, I'd rather get it from my father when it'll be mine forever. I know you're a liar. You'll give it to me, but you're gonna, you're not, I'm not going to have it forever, so I'm not listening to you, Satan. Right? By the way, don't you listen to Satan either. The triumphing of the wicked is short. Sin is very delightful initially, right? Sin, the pleasures of sin for a season, the Bible calls it. Of course, Satan couldn't get anybody to sin if it wasn't fun and pleasurable. But Satan only shows you the front of the house. He doesn't show you the lousy backyard full of junk cars and trash. Or the inside of the house, for that matter. It looks great on the outside. Oh, this is wonderful. But then, you know, and we've all experienced that to one degree or another. <laughs> okay. So, let's look at this. And what are, we, what are we talking about here? His end. Well, oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> his end, on my notes, I guess I didn't connect it on the screen, his end is his defeat at the Battle of Armageddon and his casting into the lake of fire. Okay, so those will be the first two humans who are ever thrown into the lake. Because you say right now, I say, Pastor Bob, where do people go now who don't believe in Jesus for eternal life? Where do they go? They go to Hades. They go to the middle of planet Earth. There's some kind of a prison down there that people remain in. Read Luke chapter 16, okay? Back then, there was an air-conditioned side and a non-air-conditioned side. But now, God's taken captivity captive, and, and, and 
the non-air conditions or the air conditioned side doesn't exist. Used to be saved and lost people went there, and one side was paradise, and the other side was hell, was Hades. But that's not eternal hell. That's just like when you get arrested for a crime, they stick you in a holding cell. It's a holding cell. Penitentiary is the lake of fire. That's where people will go forever and ever. Okay? So, let me ask you, we've just got a, a minute or two here. Does anybody, there's a lot of stuff here, but, you know, again, our, our takeaway here is this, everybody. If, if part of these prophecies have been fulfilled, and they have, these verses here, these four verses we've studied, 24, 25, 26, 27, some of them have already been fulfilled. What does that mean for you and I? Well, then if God fulfilled some of them, God will fulfill all of them. We are just simply waiting. God keeps his word. You go through the Bible, there isn't anything God said in there that hasn't come to pass. For instance, the soul that sins, it shall die. You know, the last time I checked, I haven't seen any 1,300 or 1,700 or 4,000 year old people walking around. Why? Because everybody sins. The soul that sins, it shall die. Okay? What God says comes to pass. Okay? So on and so on and so on. We could go through 8 million things in God's word like that. So, you get the idea. Anybody have a certain question that you might have wanted to throw at me? You know, I know, okay, yeah, I'll repeat, I'll repeat it for the, for the uh, video, but go ahead, Jeff. You know that um, Israel, the book of Israel was about the time of the Red Heifer being down there Yeah, definitely. And again, again, I say we're making educated guesses here. You know, no, uh, no one should be just like on these very minute points. We shouldn't be trying to make dogmatic statements. I know the way and nobody else, their interpretations are wrong and only Pastor Bob is right and you should only read my commentary on Revelation. You know, that kind of, no. You know, we read it and we study. And remember Paul said, read Listen to me, study, and then you go back and study. Be a Berean Christian. Study it. If there's something that puts a question in your head, by a pastor, preacher, teacher, someone on TV, someone, don't sit there like, oh, that's wonderful. You know, like you just take everything everybody says. No, we put it to the test. So, Jeff, to answer your question, it's a great question. Jeff, what Jeff asked, and this is for the people listening in, I don't know if they could have heard his question, but Jeff, Jeff asked, do we have some kind of timeline in the Bible for all these different events, like the coming of the Antichrist and the false prophet and the building of the temple and the desecrating of the temple? And Yeah, in a nutshell, Jeff, what, what Bible scholars have done is they've taken all these puzzle pieces. Okay, We've got the outside of the puzzle put in place. You do the frame first so you can see where all the other ones fit in, and then you're looking at the Bible. That's the front box of the puzzle. And you're taking each verse, you're taking the pieces and putting them in place. So, yeah, so basically, Jeff, you know, you can't go and get a date or an exact date or time, but generally speaking, uh, most dispensationalists would look at it this way. The man of sin, if, if he's alive right now, and it's very possible that he is, he's just a local yokel. He's just a Middle Eastern despot of some kind dwelling out there somewhere in the Middle East. But he gains power, and he gains more power, and he gains more power. That'll go right through the first three and a half years. But eventually, Jeff, he gets enough power, because, of course, because Satan comes in. He's worshiping Satan, the book of Daniel. We're going to come back to studying him as the Satan worshiper. But, but, He's going to be 
worshiping Satan, and so Satan says, well, here's a guy that can do my bidding. He doesn't tell him that. <laughs> he tells him, oh, I'm going to make you God on earth, and he gives him all this glory. He doesn't tell him his real motives in doing all this. He doesn't tell him it's only going to last for three and a half years. He, thinks he, he really thinks he can bring utopia on earth. He would never do it if he thought that in three and a half years he was going to get thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> but anyway, so he's going, to, he's going to be a Middle Eastern king. Israel, Jeff, and again, this is, can't be 100% on this, but this peace pact, some people think that this peace pact will take place with the ten nations, will take place before the rapture occurs. Personally, I think it may occur at some point in time, Jeff, and then that's, that's like the thing that God's going to use to set the rapture in, in motion. Some say it happens just a little bit before it, and the rapture happens. Like myself, I would tend to think that, that it would happen almost right with it, like when it's signed. Because 2 Thessalonians says, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Okay, and so, um, so nonetheless, that, that treaty that's going to be seven years long initially, but in the middle of it, it gets cut. So yeah, we've got things going. So basically, the, the man of sin is just a Middle Eastern king for the first three and a half years, but keeps gaining power. We're going to see in Daniel that he gets Ethiopia, Sudan, and, uh, and let's see, what was the third one? Egypt. He gets those nations. He conquers them. He gets all their gold and silver. Whoa. So he keeps prospering, prospering, prospering. And then in the middle, Satan prospers him and gives him worldwide rule. He institutes his mark. So yeah, definitely, but not, you do get, you do get these hints, and, we all, and all of the people try to put them together. Bible scholars try to put, piece them together carefully, but we, nobody should say, well, you're just wrong and I'm right about that. You know, you just don't want to do that. That's just not cool. Okay. Anybody else have a question? So, okay. Well, you know what, everybody? Let me just encourage you. Keep praying for the people that need prayer, the people with COVID, our president, the leaders of our country, all of them. Let's pray for everybody in our country. God will protect people and, and that this will start to go down and down, that maybe these vaccines will come. I'm not a big fan of vaccines, but I know other people will be very interested in vaccines. So... Anyway, so I'm just saying let's, let's be taking this to God, be praying for our nation, be praying. The, the um, election that's coming is so important. I, I'm believing, I believe that I'm going to do a message on who that we should be voting for, and I'm not going to name the person. I'm going to be putting things up on the screen and let you make the decision. I'm not going to say vote for this person or vote. I'm not going to say that, but I'm going to say, here's the kind of things that are held by candidates, and you make your decision based on what I'm showing you there. I'm going to do that before election comes around. Uh, yes, Jeff. Bernie Anderson's point of view, what am I, what was God, God, Okay. Okay. All right, well, then after I preach, you could go to I can't, what is it? I, I, voters, guide. I voters Guide. Okay, I Voters Guide. You go there, and then you could see who I was talking about. <laughs> you could look, they'll give the name. But, no, but anyway, I've got, I've got a list that I think everybody needs to see and think about because, listen, everybody, our country is at the point of no return. We're either going into totalitarianism, right now, the foundations are creaking. The building is shaking, and if we don't wise up just what happened to Russia and Europe and all the communism that took place there, they were offered, young people were offered everything on a silver platter saying, we know how your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents have messed everything up. We know how horrible this is for you how sad your lives are. They had everything. You have nothing. Hey, we can give you 
nirvana, we can give you a nation like you, and they fell for it, hook, line, and sinker, and it destroyed. They did not get what they were promised. They got totalitarianism where the government said, you're going to think like we think, you're going to speak like we speak, you're going to do what we do. Don't you speak anything unless we put our seal of approval on it. Preacher, don't you say a single word unless it's what we want you to say. Is that the kind of world we want to live in, everybody? Hey, it's happening. By the way, it's already happened in colleges. Yeah. If I went to any college and tried to speak there what I speak here, they would immediately shout me down and egg me and throw things at me and grab me and beat me up and drag me out the outside of the city. They don't do that. They have what's called safe zones. You could go into these little areas. If you want to talk, you got 10 square feet over there that you can talk in and share what you want to share, but don't ever do it in class, don't ever do it in the hallways, don't ever, you got the idea? There's already totalitarianism on uh, college campuses. It's already happened. And by the way, Jeff's exactly right, corporate America. See, Jeff, that's the difference. Back then, it was the, uh, it was the government. It was the government pressing down on people. Now, it's corporate America saying, if you, don't, uh, if you don't get in line with us, you're off of this, you're off of that, you know, we'll, we, will, we will quit supporting. Okay, television, you want to stay on the air? You're not getting our money anymore. Huh. So these big co companies start pulling their money away from different uh, TV shows because they don't like what the TV shows are saying. And it's already happened, by the way. So anyway, so just you know, what I wanted to say here at the end is just keep on keeping on, keep fighting, keep glorifying God, keep honoring him, keep witnessing, keep doing the things that you know that are right to do. And then Paul said, and having done all, to stand. Stand for what is right. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't do that. We're still living in a free society. We're still living in America and they can't tell us what to say. They can't do, do those kind of things. We're a, we are free under the Constitution. So let's bow our heads for prayer, everybody. Father, we want to thank you for your word. And Lord, we realize that we have to have a fine balance here, Lord. We just can't go berserk and get crazy. We're believers. We're your people. We're to be salt and light. But Lord, we need to be salt and light. We need to take a stand. We need to shine the light of God into a dark world. So Father, please help every one of us. Help yours truly, Lord, as I lead a church of people, Lord, many people. I pray, Lord, that you'll help me to be an example and an encouragement. And Lord, this week I ask that your hand will rest on your people. You'll protect them from COVID. You'll protect them from the evil one and his lies. And we ask all these things, Lord, in your precious name and for your sake. Amen. All right, have a wonderful week and have a great uh, time in God's word this week. God bless everybody that's watched online. Thank you so much.